today in our passage. Genesis 1 through 11 is the beginning of the human race, featuring four major subjects, as you know, creation, the way the world was before things went wrong, Genesis 1 and 2. And then you have the fall, Genesis 3 through 5, where everything went haywire. And yet, in the midst of all of that sin, there's hope that there's coming a Messiah to restore everything to how it was originally. Genesis 3 verse 15, as we have talked about, is really the first um, prophecy about the coming Messiah, Jesus. So there's hope in the midst of the calamity, but then comes one of the biggest events in human history called the flood. That's in chapter 6 through 9, and that's what we've been studying of late. We've discussed or studied events before the flood, Genesis 6, the flood itself, Genesis 7, the abating of the flood waters, Genesis 8, and now we are into events following the flood. Post-flood events, chapter 9. And those post-flood events represent, first of all, the Noahic covenant. God enters at this point into a covenant with Noah and that becomes the beginning of an institution that God graciously gave to humanity called the institution of human government. Last week or the last couple of weeks as we have studied it, it begins with promises. Noah comes out of the ark and he is a worshiper and he offers a sacrifice unto the Lord And the Lord, at that point, begins to make three promises to Noah. Number one, never to flood the earth again. Number two, man's nature has not been altered because of the flood. The same old wickedness of man will continue. And then number three, the earth is going to go through uninterrupted seasons or cycles until the Lord brings an end to it all one day by fire. And now we move into Genesis chapter 9 verses 1 through 7 where we see a tremendous provision from God as part of this covenant with Noah and this is where government itself starts. There has been up to this point in time no institution of human government. So here's a little outline that we can use to navigate our way through these verses. I'm not sure how far we'll make it today, but let's see what we can do. Beginning at verse 1, you see a similar or a familiar creation, in this case, recreation theme. And notice what verse 1 says, And God blessed Noah and his sons. And said to them, be fruitful and multiply. You'll notice first of all that God blessed Noah and his sons. God's blessing has always been on humanity. Human beings are different than any creature that God has made. They bear his very image. And so if you are a member of the human family, which we all are, we are blessed Reminds us of Genesis 1, verse 28, where it says very clearly, God bless them. And then it's repeated there in Genesis 5 and verse 2, he blessed them. And so you should feel blessed. You should feel blessed. You're not a curse. You're not an accident. You're not a blight on the earth. In fact, the earth itself was made for you, and God has intentionally blessed you as a member of the human race. We are not naked apes. We are not products of from the goo to you via the zoo over billions of years. You're a special handiwork of God, specially designed creation. Kind of reminds me of what David said in the Psalms. He kind of, in Psalm 139, I don't know what he was doing. Was he sitting under a tree? But he sort of looked at himself. Um, I like to think that he was looking at maybe his own fingerprints and how they were different than all the other fingerprints of all of the other people that have ever 
live. Maybe he was thinking about his respiratory system and its complexity as he was inhaling and exhaling. Maybe he was thinking about his circulatory system and all that goes into making a person a person. And he says there in Psalm 139, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This is really the message that we need to be giving out to people in this time of despair because the world system is telling them that they are blights and they are accidents and their life has no meaning or purpose or dignity or sacredness or significance and the Bible is saying the exact opposite. God bless the human race from the beginning. And then you'll also notice there in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 2, familiar language, he says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. It's exactly what God told Adam and Eve to do in Genesis 1, 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And with the global deluge, the global flood, and the world's population wiped out except for eight people. That mandate now rests upon Noah's sons to repopulate the earth along with their respective wives. Not only are human beings not a curse, but neither are children. The Bible is very clear that children are a blessing from the Lord. We sort of, in Western civilization, Western culture, look at children as irritants, in the way, holding back, my budget from what I think it ought to be in terms of personal prosperity. And yet, we need to refresh ourselves in what the Bible actually says about children. They are a special blessing from God to you. So, oh my goodness, as I'm teaching here, this actually does apply to Mother's Day, doesn't it? Wow. It's amazing what the Lord does with speaking through donkeys. Uh, You know, sometimes as preachers, we get a little bit of a big head, you know, look at how God is using me, and the Holy Spirit will say, well, I spoke through a donkey in the book of Numbers, so (laughs) if I can use a donkey, I can use you. So God blessed the human race, and God told the human race following the flood to be fruitful and multiply. Now, what's interesting in verse 1 is what's missing. You remember what God said in Genesis 1, 26 through 28 about ruling. He said, let them rule Adam and Eve over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, etc. Verse 28, he said, subdue the earth and rule over it. And what you'll notice is that was the beginning of an office that we call the office of theocratic administrator, which simply means someone who governs for God. God vested Adam and Eve with authority over the earth. And yet, that part of it is not repeated here. The blessing is repeated, be fruitful and multiply is repeated, but this language of dominion and authority over the earth is not mentioned. Now, why is that? Because with the fall of man, Satan has become the prince and power of the air. That's the great tragedy of what happened in the fall in Eden. Satan used circumstances to put into motion the sin of the human race, which elevated Satan to the authority over this planet. The rest of the scripture bears this out very well. He is the prince and power of the air. He's the prince of this world, the god of this age. You see all of the scriptures there on the right. He is someone that roams about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And we know from 1 John 5 verse 19 that the whole world lies in his power. And this is why we are called to Ephesians 6 verse 12, put on the what? Full armor of God because we're in a wrestling match with the prince and power of the air, Satan himself. And that won't change until Jesus 
touches down on planet earth. And by the way, your Bible says he will do that. It's actually in the oldest book of the Bible, the book of Job. Job chapter 19, it's around verses 25 and 26 where Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives and in the end he will take his stand upon the earth. Zechariah chapter 14 verses 2 and 3 says when he comes back his feet will touch the Mount of Olives and the Mount of Olives will be split from east to west. And as the disciples watched Jesus ascend in Acts chapter 1, the angels there said to them, why are you looking in the sky? This man Jesus will come just like he left. He left physically, visibly, and tangibly, and he's coming back just the same way. We believe in a literal second coming. And only when that second coming happens will Satan be dethroned. And in the meantime, we are living on hostile territory. That's why we are called aliens in this world. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20 calls us ambassadors. We are here to represent God's values on enemy territory. If I am America's ambassador to Iran, let's say, I'm not there in Iran to orchestrate regime change. I'm there to represent American values in a place where where the world or that part of the world doesn't understand American values. That's your calling as a Christian. That's why it's so difficult for you sometimes as a Christian to fit in with this world. It's difficult to fit in in your workplace. It's difficult to fit in sometimes in your own family. God forbid, sometimes it's difficult for you to fit in even in your your own church. And there's this sort of unnatural tension between us and the world. And the reason is because we are not subduing the world currently. We are representing Christian values in a world that is under Satan's dominion. And you learn this by observing not just what verse 1 says, but what it leaves out. But you'll notice there in verse 2 that God compensates for that. And what does he say in verse 2? He says, the fear and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth... And on every bird of the sky, with everything that creeps on the ground, and all the fish of the sea, into your hand they are given. So the authority language is missing here, but at the same time, God compensates for that by putting into the animal kingdom a fear of man. We are not here to be ruled by the animals. We are here to subdue the animal kingdom. We are not to be in the cages at the zoo. It's the other way around. And so man's authority over the animal kingdom, whether in the sky, the earth, etc., continues on even though Satan is now the prince and power of the air. Arnold Fruchtenbaum in his Genesis commentary puts it this way, nevertheless the command to subdue the earth is not repeated since this authority now belongs to Satan who usurped the authority from man when man fell. The command to multiply is repeated again but the command to subdue the earth is not repeated. So man retains the authority over the animal kingdom and the vegetable kingdom, but he does not have authority over the earth. That authority has been given to Satan who usurped this authority from man. John 12 verse 31 states that Satan is the prince and power of the world. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4 says that he is the God of this age. And Luke 4 and verse 6 states that Satan has authority over the kingdoms of this world but the authority of man over the animals continues on this is the whole significance of Adam naming the animals in Genesis 2 verses 18 through 20 
Every animal that God brought to Adam, Adam gave that animal a name. And in the Bible, and I wish we had time to look up all these verses, and we don't. But in the Bible, when you name something, it's your authority over it. And God allowed Adam to name the animals to give him authority over the animal kingdom. And that authority continues on here in the post-flood world. And it's interesting at this point, verse 3, man now for the very first time becomes a meat eater or carnivorous. Look at verse 3. It says, every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I have given all to you as I have given the green plant. This is a change in rules. This is something to pay attention to as you move through the Bible. The rules will change from time to time. The plan of salvation is in harmony. It's always consistent. People are always individually saved by faith alone in Christ alone. Old Testament saints looking forward. Those of us in the church age looking backward to what Jesus did. But the plan of salvation is always the same. That's a constant But as you move through the Bible, what you'll see is God changes the rules concerning the outworking of his purposes. So prior to this point in time, man was herbivorous and not carnivorous. And now man, for the very first time, is given permission to eat meat. Again, the verse says, every living thing that is alive shall be food for you, for I have given all to you as I gave the green plant. Very different instructions than what you had earlier. God on the sixth day of creation was very clear, was he not? Genesis 1, 29 through 30, then God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed to that is on the surface of the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the field and to every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, it, I have given every green plant for food and it was so. And when we were teaching through that material, people were asking me, well, pastor, then why is it I always see you over at the Longhorn Steakhouse? And my answer is, I don't go to the Longhorn Steakhouse because of Genesis 1, but I go because of Genesis 9. (laughs) Genesis 9 gives me that permission, amen? Amen. And obviously this is Texas, so we got to have a Genesis 9 somewhere or we're going to be in a world of, world of trouble. But you have to understand that prior to this point in time, herbivorous was the norm, not carnivorous. Why is that? Because the moment you have the eating of animal meat is the moment you have to introduce into the world a concept where animals have to be killed so they can be eaten. Now, that doesn't fit the original design of God because in the original design of God, there was no what? There was no death. You have to understand this, that God originally created a world with no death in it whatsoever. Death, as the Apostle Paul calls it, is an, is an intruder. It's an enemy. It came into existence as a consequence of man's rebellion against God, but it was never God's original design. So you cannot have a scenario where early man, prior to the fall, were eating animals because that involves death. Genesis 2 verses 16 and 17 says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. I mean, it's very clear that when death enters the picture, it's not a result of God's design. It's a result of man's rebellion. And boy, did death ever enter. Genesis 3 verse 19 is the introduction of death. It says, by the sweat of your face, post-fall now, Post sin, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat your bread till you return to the ground. 
because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. You came right out of the dirt, and you're going right back into the dirt from which you came. And if you monitor your pictures, particularly if you're on social media, and all of a sudden they bring up a picture of you five years ago, you'll see pretty much what I'm talking about. Because you don't look the same as you did five years ago, and neither do I. Why? Because I'm gradually being pulled back into the ground or the dirt. This isn't what God set up the world to be. This is the consequence of sin. Paul is very clear that death came into existence because of Adam's sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22 says, For since by a man came death, but by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Until Adam did what he did in Eden, there was no concept of death. It didn't exist. Romans 5 and verse 12 is very clear. It says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. You don't have death until Adam sins. And his nature is then transferred to us and we sin. And death now has followed us into the cursed world. When God clothed Adam and Eve for their transgression, Genesis 3 verse 21, he clothed them with garments of skin. And where did those garments of skin come from? An animal was killed right then and there. And I think that was a complete and total shock to the thinking of Adam and Eve because they had no concept of death. And God was teaching them right at the very beginning that sin is costly. But because I am clothing you, the good news in it, we call this the gospel, you don't have to pay the cost. I will pay the cost. Well, who pays? The animal that was just killed to get the skin, to cover you. Well, what did the animal do wrong? Nothing. That's the point. This is how a holy God unconditionally forgives sin and yet still maintains his holiness. If he were to say, well, you know, boys will be boys, I'll just look the other way. He's violating his nature of holiness. Someone's got to pay here. And God kills an innocent animal and uses the skin from that transaction to clothe Adam and Eve. All of this, of course, is a beautiful picture pointing to what Jesus did for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. He was our innocent scapegoat who died not just to show me how much God loves me, that's part of it, but he died as my substitute. It should have been me hanging on the cross. It should have been you hanging on the cross. But he hung on the cross in our place. If you're into big words, this is what we call the vicarious penal substitutionary atonement or atoning death of Jesus Christ. Vicarious in the place of another, penal punishment, substitute. This is going to be costly. And the animal was killed. Adam and Eve had no idea what death was. And that no, no doubt was a complete shock to them. Because they probably figured, ah, it's just a minor trans transgression. What's the big deal? Oh, it's a big deal. You've just transgressed the character of a holy God. And someone has to pay here. And boom, right at the dawn of human history, God is showing the expense or the cost associated with sin. The wonderful thing about this is one of these days, this world is going to be recreated. There's going to be a brand new world. It's described in Revelation 21 and 22. And in that world, the very things that trouble us in our world will be taken out of that world. And when that world comes on the scene, and it will, because God cannot lie, one of the things that will be missing is death. 
It'll be a rollback in a sense, just like to the Garden of Eden before death entered the picture. Will man become herbivorous all over again? I don't know. I would think so. So enjoy your steak now while you can, I guess. But it says there in Revelation 21 verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. No longer will there be any mourning or crying or pain for the first things have passed away. Why, why take a position like this? Why not just cooperate with evolutionary thought, pastor? Why, why not just loosen your grip a little bit and just kind of fudge a little bit on this whole death thing? and carnivorous thing and herbivorous thing. I mean, what's, what's the big deal of just saying man has always been carnivorous? I mean, the evolutionists in the biology class all tell me that. I mean, why don't you just say that? I mean, why don't you just, you know, cooperate a little bit with the world system? I personally can't cooperate with that belief for two reasons. Number one, it is an attack on the character of God. If you have death in the world before the fall, then God really is not as loving as we think he is. And beyond that, when this world is recreated and we move into the eternal state, and if the eternal state is going to be just like Eden, then maybe there's going to be death in that world. Because after all, the eternal state is remodeled a remodel, so to speak, on what happened in Eden with some variations mixed in. I don't know if I want to go if that world has the same problems in it that this world has. So it may seem like a minor thing, but what you start to see is it's an assault on the character of God. He's not as merciful as we thought, and it's an assault on hope. You have to understand something about the Bible, that everything from Genesis 3 to Revelation 20, before the eternal state starts, is an abnormality. The mistake that we make is we pretend that what is happening today is normal. It's always been, and it will always be, uniformitarian thinking. And I'm here to tell you that that is not true. What we are experiencing today, what we have experienced since the fall, what we will experience until the eternal state is ushered in is an abnormality. It's something that should never have happened, yet it happened. And God has made provision to fix the problem. If you want to study what's normal... You don't look at the conditions of the world today. You look at Genesis 1 and 2. Now that's normal. And you look at Revelation 21 and 22. That's normal. That's the way it's supposed to be. Everything in between is what is not supposed to be. Because as you're sharing your faith with unbelievers, one of the things they're going to say to you is, hey, God is a God of love? Who are you kidding? Look at the cancer victims in my family. Look at uh, so-and-so that was hit in the crosswalk. Look at someone that is going through a financial downturn or a nasty divorce or is addicted to drugs. Don't, Don't talk to me about your God of love when all of these evil things are happening all around me. And believe it or not, when that accusation comes your way, and it will... This is called the problem of evil. You actually have an answer. The answer is it's an abnormality. It shouldn't be. What's normal is Eden. That's normal. What's normal is the new Jerusalem and the eternal state. That's normal. Everything in between is an abnormality. And in spite of the abnormality, God actually entered into history to experience suffering in our place so that we could be saved. Now that's a God worth worshiping when you think about it. He doesn't just sit up there in heaven and say, wow, they really goofed this one up. He actually does something to fix the problem. 
And that really becomes the story of the Bible. What, what, what is the Bible about? Complicated book, can be 66 books, but let me just summarize it for you in a nutshell. The Bible is from a garden to a city with a cross in between. That's the Bible. And it's so wonderful to understand the hope that we as Christians are destined for. But he says something else there in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 4. Notice what he says. Only, now he's giving some restrictions concerning the carnivorous change in man. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is its blood. The blood, or the consumption of blood, just for the sake of consuming blood, is off, off limits. Now why is that? Well, what we'll discover as we move through the Bible is that's going to be an injunction that will come into existence centuries later. Thousands of years later, actually, in what is called the Mosaic Covenant. In the Mosaic Covenant that God will make with the nation of Israel, at this point we don't even know there's going to be an Israel. It will say this in Leviticus 17 verse 11, for, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is the body by reason of the life that makes atonement. The blood is off limits. And so what you see here is sort of a precursor to the Mosaic law. A lot of the things spoken of in the Mosaic Law actually have a basis in the covenant that God made with Noah. The book of Genesis reads that way. Uh, there's something in the Mosaic Law called Leverite marriage. And it has to do with if a, uh, a person dies, if a woman dies, or if the husband dies, I should say, and she has no children then the husband's brother is to marry her and have children with her so that the family line will not be extinguished. And the ladies are saying, are you kidding me? Have you met my brother-in-law? My goodness. <laughs> and so it's a, it's a very interesting thing that is in play concerning the law of Moses. It's not for the church age, but it's in the law of Moses. And what you'll see is that has actually a cultural precedent in God's dealings with something that happens in Genesis 38. So even though the Mosaic law doesn't come into existence yet, there's a cultural basis already on the books for some of the things that God is going to articulate concerning the law of Moses. Why is the blood off limits? Arnold Fruchtenbaum summarizes as follows. He says this principle that the life of the flesh is in the blood is the same prohibition later incorporated into the Mosaic law. This prohibition will be a later, uh, will play a later role in advice given to believers in the book of Acts. Furthermore, and here's the interesting part of it, drinking blood is often connected with demonism. Thus, the prohibition might be to some degree a response to the events of Genesis 6 verses 1 through 4 where intermarriage took place between humans and fallen angels. It's not something to be dogmatic about. As I like to say, it's probably not something to start a new church over. But there was heavy demonic involvement in Genesis 6. We've studied all about it. And it could be that this drinking of the blood had something to do with demonism. And God in the post-flood world is saying, I don't want you to go back to what it was like before the flood, and so the blood is off limits. He mentions here the book of Acts, chapter 15. He says, this prohibition will play a later role in the advice given to the Gentile believers in Acts 15. Now, when you go to Acts 15, it's a very interesting passage. It's the council at Jerusalem. 
And they had a big powwow there in Jerusalem because at that point in church history, the church was expanding greatly and non-Jews were getting saved. And the question there is, what in the world are we going to do with all of these Gentiles that are now believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, should we make them part of Israel? Should we bring them under the Mosaic law? And the church there ruled in Acts 15, the Jewish leadership said no. They're saved, they're part of the church, we don't have to put them under the law of Moses as we Jews have been under the law of Moses for the last 1,500 years. I really like what Peter says there in Acts 15 verse 10. He says that now therefore why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our, for our fathers nor we have been able to bear. Peter and James there say, hey, we've done a lousy job as Jews keeping the law of Moses. Just read our history. Why would we put Gentiles under the law of Moses? That's insanity. And then you have the ruling at the council at Jerusalem in Acts 15 verse 20. It says, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contained by idols from fornication and what is strangled and from blood. And then in verse 29, it says that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. So it's kind of an odd ruling. Are we under the law of Moses or not? First, you tell us we're not under the law of Moses. Then you tell us to stay away from certain things like the consumption of blood. Well, the reason James and Peter say stay away from the blood is not because he's putting the church back under the law of Moses. He couldn't be putting the church under the law of Moses because they had just emerged or the ruling was they're not under the law of Moses. He's simply reminding them, I believe there, what the Noahic covenant says. Yeah, you're not under the law of Moses, but the law, the, the Mosaic law is still worldwide and in effect. So stay away from the blood. And that may be a better way of understanding Acts 15, the prohibition against blood. It's a reiteration of God's covenant with Noah. So it's interesting that a lot of the things in the beginning of the Bible help explain alleged problems that come up in the middle of the Bible or towards the end of the Bible. But we move now into verses five and six where now you see the beginning or the origin of human government. Notice, if you will, verses five and six. And here's where capital punishment comes into existence for the first time. Surely I will require your lifeblood from every beast, I will require it, and from every man and from every man's brother I will require the life of man. Now look at verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood by God, doesn't say that does it? Whoever sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. Well, why is that? For in the image of God has God made Man, What you see coming into existence for the very first time is a provision that God gave to the human race in the Noahic covenant called the institution of human government. Why do we have government? We have government because of what the world was like before the flood. Do you remember what it was like? Corruption and violence swept the earth. That's how people are like in their natural state. And unless they are deterred from certain harmful and violent activities through the threat of punishment, they will just do whatever their heart wants them to do. And so God says we're going to put an end to that 
the flood has happened, the earth is being repopulated, the nature of man hasn't changed. So preventing us from going back to the wild, wild west mindset, vigilantism, everyone doing what was right in their own eyes, violence and corruption sweeping the globe, we're going to have to put something in effect called the institution of human government, which exists for what purpose? Commending those who do right and condemning those who do wrong through the threat of punishment. Of course, when you go into certain New Testament passages, you'll see Paul the Apostle speaking along these lines. Paul didn't invent this idea. He's drawing from the Noahic Covenant. Romans 13 verses 1 through 7 is the classic passage on the institution of human government. Here's just a few verses from it. Verses 3 through 5, Paul in the New Testament says, For rulers are not a cause for fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Then do what is right, and you will have praise from the same. For it, the government, is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the what? Sword. That reminds us of Genesis 9 verse 6, doesn't it? For it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it, government, is a minister of God and an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Why does government exist? To punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. And if we don't have that in effect, then you've got Genesis 6 and violence and corruption sweeping the earth all over again. You know, it it reminds me very much of the riots and Fortunately, by God's grace, I had to, in 1992, roughly, drive right through that area of Los Angeles where those riots took place, you remember, in the wake of the Rodney King verdict. And fortunately, those riots happened on a particular day of the week that I didn't have to drive through. But I I drove through that area the day before the riots broke out and the day after the riots broke out, and it was stunning what you see how businesses that once there were burned to the ground. And if you want to understand what the world is like without any government at all, that's the picture of it. Because once people in those riots figured out that they weren't going to get caught because there was a window there where the police couldn't get in to remedy the situation, Every vile, wicked intent of man's heart came to the service and people just walked in to department stores, broke windows, took whatever they want, burned down whatever they wanted, etc. That's what the world is like without human government. That's what we are like in our natural state. If I had my way, I would whip into church this morning at 85 miles an hour because I was running late. I know that's surprising to some of you. A pastor would run late. I can't believe it. But I did not come in to here 85 miles an hour. And the reason I lowered my speed is not because I'm such a great human being. I wasn't sitting there thinking about the goodness of mankind and what can I do for my fellow man. I was thinking of my own holy trinity, me, myself, and I. But I lowered my speed anyway because I didn't want to get the ticket. See that? But what if there's no threat of ever giving, getting a ticket? I would come in at 85 miles an hour. And if I come in at 85 miles an hour, everyone else is at risk. That's why government exists. It's a, it's a provision of God. It's a blessing of God. This is why Paul calls those who work for the government, did you catch this? Ministers. You mean a minister is not just someone who stands behind a pulpit? No. Those who work for the government are ministers of God. They may not even know Jesus. But they are functioning under the Noahic covenant, which God has given as a blessing to humanity. It allows the human race to be perpetuated in spite of its evil. We know about its evil from last week, Genesis 8.21. The inclination of man's thoughts and heart is 
evil from childhood. The flood may have fixed the outside, but it sure didn't fix the internal heart of man. So if man's nature never changed post-flood as the earth is now being repopulated, how do you prevent a rerun of Genesis 6 where violence and corruption sweep the earth? Answer, a provision of God given through Noah to the whole human race, a blessing called the institution of human government given in the Noahic covenant. So Paul says in Romans 13, pay your taxes. Render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render under God the things that are God's. Right out of the teachings of Jesus. Why, why would something be in the Bible about paying taxes? Because we're obligated to finance or fund this institution that God created for our own good. It says in Romans 13, submit to government because it's there for your own good. It says respect government. Have, Have a high opinion of government. Wow, now I'm stepping on toes. Why? There's a lot of people in this world, I have zero respect for them because of their character but I respect them anyway because of their office. Their office is from God. They they don't even know God. But I respect them because I respect the office, because I respect the Noahic covenant. It's not just Paul the Apostle who talks this way. It's Peter. Peter in his little epistle in 1 Peter 2 verses 13 and 14 says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every institution, whether to a king as one in authority or as to governors sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. Government exists to punish those who do evil and commend those who do right, which deter criminal activity it deters murders so we submit whenever possible to human government Titus uh, chapter 3 and verse 1 says remind them to be subject to rulers to authorities to be obedient and to be ready for every good deed 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4. You know what it tells us to do? It tells us to pray for the government. It says, first of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, specifically for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity we want to have we don't want a genesis 6 rerun we want order in society and so it involves praying for those in government i mean it doesn't even say here pray for them as long as they're a republican now maybe if i come out with my authorized version of the bible i would put that in there but i didn't write the bible god wrote the bible And God tells us to, first of all, rather than complaining about them all of the time and filling up their email box with complaint after complaint after complaint, and by the way, that's your right as an American to do that. Nothing wrong with that. First of all, are you on your knees interceding for them? Are you praying for them? Because they're functioning under a covenantal system that God himself created for our own good. And this now becomes the beginning, what I'm speaking of here, the beginning of the United States of America. According to this uh, particular study by Donald Lutz, Lutz and Heinemann, right here at the University of Houston. Back around 1981, they went through all of the writings of the founding fathers that they could find. And they tried to figure out when our founding fathers were putting together government, what were they thinking about? 
When Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence in 1776 and the Constitution was adopted, debated, and ratified in 1789 and the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the United States Constitution were formally formulated in 1789, what were our founding fathers thinking about? You know what these two secular political scientists Discovered, you can read this all for yourself in a book called The Origins of American Constitutionalism. They were thinking about the Bible. 34%, that's four times more than any other source. The founding fathers of the United States, imperfect people, had on their mind this book. That's what they were thinking about, that's what they were talking about, that's what they were debating. They were trying to come up with a government that works because they had fled the nightmare of totalitarianism in Europe. And then after they were thinking about the Bible, who else were they thinking about? Well, the second most cited person, the third most cited person, The fourth most cited source, I should say, is number one, Baron Montesquieu, number two, William Blackstone, number three, John Locke. Baron Montesquieu, separation of powers. We've got to divide government up so it doesn't become tyrannical. William Blackstone, inalienable rights. There's certain rights that people have that the government can't take away. William Blackstone. John Locke, social compact theory. If we're going to come together in this state of nature, Locke said, and create government, we have to give it certain powers, which means we have to cede certain powers to the state. Social compact theory, John Locke. Do you know what Montesquieu was thinking about when our founding fathers borrowed from his writings to formulate separation of powers? He was thinking about the Bible. How do I know that? Baron Montesquieu, that our founding fathers drew from, said this, the Christian religion is a stranger to mere despotic power. The mild list so frequently recommended in the Gospels is incompatible with despotic rage, with a prince, with which a prince punishes his subjects and exercises himself in cruelty. We see, or shall see, that we owe to Christianity in a government a certain political law and a certain, and in a certain war, a certain law of nations benefits which nature can sufficiently acknowledge. When our founding fathers took the writings of Montesquieu, what you have to understand is Montesquieu was thinking about Jesus. He was thinking about the Bible. He was thinking about Christianity. How about William Blackstone? What was Blackstone thinking about? Blackstone, who wrote the famous commentaries on the legal system, in England and in early America was thinking about the Bible too. Blackstone says this, thus when the supreme being formed the universe and created the matter out of nothing, he imposed upon it certain principles upon that matter from which it can never depart and without which it would cease to be if we farther advance from mere Inactive matter to vegetable and animal life, we shall find them still governed by laws, more numerous indeed, but equally fixed and invariable. Man considered as a creature must necessarily be subject to the laws of his creator, for he is an entirely dependent being." No human laws should be suffered that contradict the laws of nature and the laws of revelation. You have to understand something that Blackstone's commentaries, until very recently, were the key legal commentaries for the United States. In fact, Finney, Second Great Awakening, got saved studying to be a lawyer. Did you know that? There were so many scripture verses in Blackstone's commentaries that he got saved. 
And he developed his conviction to be a preacher by studying to be a lawyer. How about that? (laughs) And Blackstone said, God has revealed himself in two sources. Creation, we would call that natural revelation, and the Bible. And the goal of going to law school and being a legislature and being a politician is to figure out what God has said in those two sources. And to come up with laws that cooperate with those two sources. In fact, if you have a law in the books that contradicts those two sources, that law should be eradicated. This is the beginning of the United States of America. And so it's from Blackstone we get this idea that we are all endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, which Thomas Jefferson took and put into our Declaration of Independence. You know where our founding fathers got their ideas, according to Calvin Coolidge? By going to church. Because the churches in colonial America were all talking this way. And in the pews were the founding fathers that says, you know, that's a good sermon. We need to take those principles and bring them into our government that we are now formulating. The third source that they quoted uh, 3% of the time is a man named John Locke. John Locke gave us social compact theory. And where did Locke get his ideas from? Where do you think? Alvin Schmidt writes, Locke's theory reflects St. Paul's Christian understanding of the natural law. Although he has been referred to as a deist, it is clear from his writings that he considered himself to be a Christian. In his, in his monograph, The Reasonableness of Christianity, published 1695, he talks about sinners being restored by Christ at the resurrection. Frequently he cites scriptures in support of his arguments. Where did John Locke get the idea of social compact theory? He was studying the book of Genesis. He was studying Genesis 9. I mean, that's our passage, isn't it? John Eidsmo, who is on our faculty at Chafer Seminary, in a wonderful book he wrote, he spoke for us at a conference a couple of years back, wrote a book called Christianity and the Constitution, and he talks about John Locke. Locke contributed the theory of social compact, the idea that men in a state of nature realize their rights are insecure and compact together to establish government and cede to that government certain powers so that government may use that power to secure the rest of their rights. The social compact theory, like the covenant, allows government only the power that God or the people will delegate This is the cornerstone of limited government. It finds its expression in the 10th Amendment to the Constitution, in the Declaration of Independence, which states that governments exist to secure human rights and derive their just power from the consent of the governed. Locke, Eidsmo says, frequently cited the Bible in his political writings. In his first treatise on government, he cited the Bible 80 times. Most pastors today in their sermons don't even cite the Bible 80 times. 42 of these citations, over 50%, come from Genesis. That's what we're studying here. 42 of these citations come from Genesis, mostly chapter 1, chapter 3. 22 biblical citations appear in his second treatise in which he argued that parents have authority over children based on the creation of Adam and Eve and their offspring. What did Blackstone say? You don't have laws that contradict laws of nature and laws of revelation. You don't have laws on the books that interfere with the parent-child relationship because God is the author of the parent-child relationship. He also argued that man has the right to possess property since God gave the earth to Adam and later to Noah. We're reading about that right here. 
Watch this. He, that's John Locke, that America's founding fathers drew from his wisdom, based the social compact theory which government is established upon the paction which God made with Noah after the deluge. John Locke got his idea of social compact theory by reading Genesis 9. His basic doctrine of parental authority and private property and social compact were based on the historical evidence of Adam and Noah. My goodness, the man believed in a historical Adam and a historical Noah. And he got to Genesis 9 and he saw what God had done through the Noahic covenant. And he says, now that we're in the business here in the United States of coming up with a form of government... Let's come up with social compact theory, which he got from the Bible. And our founding fathers reached back into the writings of Locke, reached back into the writings of Montesquieu, reached uh, back into the writings of, who am I forgetting there? Uh, but thank you, very good. Blackstone, and grabbed all of these ideas and brought them into public life. America's existence came governmentally and nationally because America's founding fathers studied the Bible. They studied the Bible directly. And when they weren't studying the Bible directly, they were studying men who had been influenced by the Bible. Well, why, Pastor, go into all of this detail? Because the whole thing is being taken apart today. And people have no idea what they're trampling on. They're trampling on one of the highest and greatest gifts that have ever come to the human race. The American Constitution. Because around the world as I speak, and this has always been the case, the default mode is totalitarianism. And our founders said, you know, we're not perfect people. By the way, God doesn't use perfect people. You know why that is, right? Because they don't exist. Everybody that wants to drag out all the skeletons in our founding fathers, I mean, they could do that in our lives too, couldn't they? We all have skeletons in our closet. We all have areas of things that aren't right. But they love Jesus. Were all of them saved? I don't know. I would think a lot of them probably were. But even the ones that weren't saved, I would say they were this, they were consciously biblical. They had respect for the Bible. They weren't there to tear it down and to remove it from public life. Far from that, they were looking at it. And they were looking at people that had been influenced by it. And they were trying to come up with something that wouldn't be totalitarian which is the default mode all, all throughout human history. It's what they had fled from. And uh, my goodness, I'm out of time. This is the United States of America. The United States of America comes out of Genesis chapter 9. Other sources, but Genesis chapter 9. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, gosh, you've given us all this teaching about how government exists to punish those who do evil and commend those who do right. What about this scenario, Pastor? What about if the government starts to do the opposite? What about if the government starts to punish the good doers and commend the evil doers? and loses its purpose that God gave it. Like in Canada. Canada is just on our northern border, folks. Here's a recent article. Canadian police barricade a church at the entrance with fencing and tarps to keep the worshipers out. That's a government that's gone astray. That's a government that's now not protecting inalienable rights, but stomping on them. 
And you gave us all these verses about submission to government and respect government and pay your taxes. What do we do now? And I'm glad you asked that question because I'm going to try to answer it next week. <laughs> That's my, what do they call it? The, the tease to bring you back for the next show. But this is more than a show, right? This is the word of God. The truth of the matter is Jesus entered our world to pay a terrible price in our place. And by trusting what he did, we can have eternal life. And that's the gospel. The Bible is a book about how to get to heaven. Yes, it's got a lot to say about government, but its primary purpose is to save the soul. And if you find yourself unsaved today, our exhortation here at Sugarland Bible Church is to trust in the completed transaction of Jesus Christ. Place your faith in him. Not in yourselves, not in your good works, but in what he did, he who said it is finished, and in a nanosecond, by receiving that gift, you're made just as righteous positionally as Jesus Christ himself. Don't hold out for a better offer because you're not going to get one. And so anyone within the sound of my voice that needs to do this, that wants to do this, as the Spirit convicts them, we invite you to do that now, even as I'm speaking. It's not a matter of joining a church, walking an aisle, giving money. It's a matter of privacy between you and the Lord, where you're convicted of your lost condition and you trust in Christ as your Savior. Christianity is not a 12-step program. It's a one-step program. That's the only condition that God requires. And so if it's something more that you need explanation on, I'm available after the service to talk. Shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for Genesis 9 and just the things that it instructs us about right down to the origins of this wonderful country that we live in that's given us so much opportunity. We know that those things are not accident. These are your handiwork as the greats of the past relied upon your truth. Help us to walk these things out this week. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said.